Hello, my fellow filmic failures. This is DS Lyons of the Movie Blues, here to recommend to you 15 pieces of content you may have missed in the doomed chaos timeline that is 2023. This is the kind of stuff that could have slipped under your radar, not so much the huge tentpole moments like Killers of the Flower Moon. Like, you don't need me to tell you to watch a Martin Scorsese movie. Anyway, before we kick things off, a quick word on 2023. Movies and TV shows this year sucked, or did they? This year, the quality and messaging of our entertainment hit an all-time low. Or did that happen, or is that happening, or who even cares anymore? Word on the street is David Fincher blew it, or did he actually kill it? This year, Marvel ruined cinema. Or did Marvel ruin itself and cinema just kind of stood there marveling in abject horror over what Marvel did to itself? This year, gay fun stuff was really fun, while stuff pretending to be gay fun stuff really was not fun for me. This year, Adam Driver put on every fake nose and wig in all of Italy and prayed for your support. But did you give any? This year, Joaquin Phoenix played a depressed fat guy haunted by his wiener. And then he played a depressed fat guy haunted by his wiener on a horse. This year, there was a movie about a cybernetic raccoon's amputee girlfriend that touched my soul deeper than the new Wes Anderson movie. And it goes without saying that, guys, it's getting fairly weird out here. So dive in with me as I explore 15 pieces of content that prove that this year wasn't total hogwash. And if you want to bask in the glorious glow of negativity, check out my top 10 disappointing films of 2023 after this list is over. Okay, let's get it started. Giddy up. <laughs> Number 15, The Deepest Breath. Literally nobody wants to drown. What? But these certified maniacs get rock hard off of it. How else would you explain why a person would want to dive straight down into the depths of an unending pit of darkness? And I'm not describing my YouTube career. I'm describing free diving, essentially the grown-up version of the game you played in the pool to see who could hold their breath the longest, but with the crushing unknowable depths of hell added. This is a sadistic sport populated by probably self-admitted sociopaths. People die constantly free diving, and hell, even when you do it correctly, you come up from the depths in a blackout state so common that the only way to truly complete a race is by giving a thumbs up. That would be like if UFC fighting wasn't a sport between two fighters, but instead between one fighter and an endless brick wall. And the only way that the fight can end is if the fighter is brought to the literal brink of death and can only escape the clutches of the Grim Reaper by giving a thumbs up. It's wild. It will make you sick and terrify you and make you feel like you're going to choke to death. So essentially, par for the course for an A24 movie. Tell me I'm yours. Oh. Fans of horror documentaries, being close to death, drowning, horror, going blind underwater, hydrogen psychosis, and waterboarding will absolutely love The Deepest Breath, the scariest documentary of the year and a movie that will make you feel so wet that Ben Shapiro's wife showed up to the premiere on a homespun raft. I mean, that one was in, and then I took it out, and I, then I put it back in. Nice. Should have kept it out. Number 14. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. Some of the guys want to see a movie and I try to talk them out of it. Leo! Are you what? Seth Rogen hasn't made anything enjoyable in years outside of phallic pottery. Oh, I do a lot of uh, hallucinogenic drugs. <laughs> and uh... I mean, the dude has torched so much of his goodwill that I'm not even sure I'd let him roll me a joint at this point, regardless of our twin state. I mean, it's gotten that bad. So color me absolutely shocked that this man took on an IP like Ninja Turtles and didn't manage to fumble the bag. Because like I said, my boy is at bag fumbling maximum right now. And as an IP, the Ninja Turtles have never been lower or less relevant. Maybe Rogan like recognized that the Turtles as an IP in his film career were like neck and neck to which one would cease to exist for another year in the cultural lexicon. But somehow, Rogan returned and pulled this one together out of literal nowhere, delivering the best Ninja Turtles film since the 1990s whatever original. This movie's hilarious, it's gorgeously animated and is a breath of absolute fresh air in the kids' movie genre. Ugh. You ratted us out. Hey, don't use that word that way. That was, I mean, so Which as of recent has become a breeding ground for pervasive mediocrity. Building on the gorgeous animation and surprise greatness of last year's Puss in Boots 2, 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that movie was somehow amazing, and now this movie is even better and more original looking and even more fun. It's almost as if you don't need Disney to make a good animated movie anymore. More of this, more Seth Rogen animated instead of Seth Rogen live action. Actually, more of Rogen producer and not like ever opening his mouth again. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> Number 13, Knock at the Cabin. M. Night Shyamalan is at the point of his career resurgence where every movie that he makes is kind of like him saying, Look, I can still make a movie. And while Old and Split and now Knock at the Cabin are all great movies in their own way, they still aren't quite hitting that signs or unbreakable fever pitch where the once glorious auteur had the whole of the American movie going public in the palm of his hands with anticipation. But as it is, Knock at the Cabin is a movie. He did it, everyone. Relax. I'm not gonna hurt you. And for a movie, it's pretty damn good. Again, not great, and again, not this shit either. So we may not have our once true cinematic god from Philly quite back yet, but he's getting there. He's building up his power like a damn anime character right now, and pretty soon he's gonna unleash his fourth masterpiece on the world after making like four horrifically bad movies and like three good ones, and then like one bad one, and then like one good one again. This guy's career for some reason is like on a tighter rope than James Franco's, and he didn't even diddle anyone. He literally just broke our hearts like seven times in a row. I believe in M. Night, almost to a degree where it's like I'm believing in the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus but I believe in M. Night's ability to deliver some modern-day masterpieces. Movies like this and Split and Old feel like high-quality Twilight Zone episodes, but lower-end quality theatrical masterpieces. At least he's smart enough to keep his work original, his budget tight, and his scripts weird enough to seem individual without crossing into a world where everybody talks like a walking fridge. I'm talking about a completely superfluous bottle of cough syrup, which that's like six bucks. Here's to his next film, and maybe his first masterpiece in a long time, but until then, you should absolutely watch Knock at the Cabin. It's a tight little movie with a great premise and great performances from great actors. Here's to hoping that all of these positive steps are leading to another Sixth Sense-sized leap. What if it turns out they aren't terrorists, but they're actually werewolves from the future? Number 12. The Devil on Trial. The Devil. So how does that work? Um, before I get into this next one, I just wanted to do a brief reminder for my audience that um, God is not real. Jewish God, not real. Muslim God, not real. Internet neckbeards God, well, she's real, but it's going to be $70 to unlock her post. If all of that offends you, then I'm sorry, skip to number 11, because the devil on trial is exactly what happens when people try to blame demons for a clear-cut case of murder. There was drinking, there was a stabbing, this is an open-shut case, this is ridiculous. In instances like this, it's funny because, like, the guy on trial is trying to say a clearly Christianity-based demon caused him to murder. The crux of this case is a claim of demonic possession. It's when an attorney for a Connecticut teenager will try to prove. But, like, what if the judge is Indian or something? It's ludicrous. And to add to the lunacy is Lorraine and Ed Warren, coming into the trial using religion-specific demon possession like they're some kind of forensic experts. This is the first piece of media to outright damn the Warrens, which is pretty uncommon considering James Wan has turned these two into basically the Marvel superhero version of Mulder and Scully at this point. But the sad fact is that no matter how sweet and next door neighbory the Warren seemed, demons still aren't real. The devil still is not real. So by association, everything that these two have ever vouched for, claimed, or done is not real. But Ed and Lorraine Warren had an agenda. They said, you guys will be millionaires. And that's gonna be something you're gonna have to grapple with with this new Netflix documentary. And it's one of the few instances where a documentary could have sensationalized something and exploited it for its horror elements, but thankfully it ended up taking the root of logic, facts, and you know, the fact that God's not real. Me. That's my opinion! Again, if believing in a sky hippie is your thing, you might not want to stomach this one. Can you earmuff it for me? But you probably should, because religion is a farce that's been at the heart of most bad things ever done on planet Earth. <clears throat> anyway, this 
movie is about how demons aren't real. I mean, it's it should do the opposite of scaring you. And it still was scarier than David Gordon Green's Exorcist abortion. Nice. Great job. Number 11, Thanksgiving. We all know director Eli Roth is a true mensch, a nice Jewish boy, and one of the sickest directors on the planet. And Thanksgiving is further proof of his cinematic psychosis. What could have easily been a crowd-pleasing PG-13 Blumhouse baby, Thanksgiving is somehow one of Roth's most hardcore and brazen films yet, which is bold on multiple fronts. Firstly, it would have been easy for Roth to take a fat paycheck and make something that could maybe help repair his career, which has been on a steady decline from a directing point of view basically every year since he made Hostel. Roth's filmography is like this trauma-esque run of unforgiving and grotesque horror films that never seems to let up. Thanksgiving continues this trend for the holidays with one of Roth's funniest, nastiest, and outright goriest films yet. This movie really took me by surprise and left me ODing on tryptophan and absolutely disgusted. Roth deserves carte blanche on his horror films, and I think that Thanksgiving opened up a hostile amount of doors for Eli once again, which is really damn exciting. More Roth, more Thanksgiving, more from one of our schlockiest directors alive, who never gives in and never seems to give up. This year, that is what I'm thankful for. Number 10, Beef. A24's remake of Crazy Rich Asians, Beef, absolutely slayed me this year. One of my favorite limited TV series in quite some time, this show was a tension-filled, hilarious, gorgeously shot slice of A24 glory, showcasing the shockingly amazing acting talents of Ali Wong, a stand-up comedian, and the ever-increasing talents of Glenn from The Walking Dead, who absolutely carries this show with a self-deprecating turn that shows how epic this man's range can be. Yeah, A24 is my lord and savior, and Beef was the perfect helping of mana from the heavens in a Euphoria off-year. Sounds like sports. Even better, the end of this series takes a turn for the hallucinatory and the profound as it finds its way towards settling the beef at the heart of the series, showing that the people who made this show were out for more meaning than a simple tiff over a parking spot. This was a deep, meaningful, and hilarious show, and Steven Yoon is now leading the pack of upcoming male actors with hit after hit after hit. Check this one out. Number 9. The Fall of the House of Usher As much as I wanted the tagline, Fall of the House of Flanagan, for my review of this series, somehow my man Mike pulled his career out of an awkward-as-hell tailspin to deliver one of the most delicious, randy, bizarre series of the year. Everything wrong about Mike Flanagan's recent efforts is still wrong here, but at least my man decided to actually have some fun with it for once. Bly Manor was a convoluted mess as well, but that show was about as fun as being locked in a haunted closet at a birthday party. Is there something you want to see in there? No. Apparently, all it took was injecting the good parts of the early American horror story seasons into Flanagan's typically over-serious work. This show had, like, the same energy that Phantasmagoria classics from the late 90s and early 2000s had, like House on Haunted Hill or Thirteen Ghosts, but for the modern age. This show really elated me with its adaptational liberties applied to the whole body of Poe's work. And whereas I was envisioning a mashup of Poe's literary world into a reference-filled paste full of jump scares and melodrama, I ended up getting a mashup of Poe's work into a reference-filled paste full of jump scares and melodrama, but plus fun. Have you ever seen so much in one place? Looks a bit like ice cream. This show had one of the few 10 out of 10 episodes on TV this year. With the whole nightclub thing, which I won't ruin here, but my god, I'm still feeling the absolute ick from that set piece down in my plums. All in all, Flanagan turns around the mess that Bly Manor and Midnight Club made of his career, offering up his strongest series since House on Haunted Hill. Good for you, Mike. Now let's see something not based on the work of a literary legend for once. Something truly original. And I don't mean Midnight Mass, because if you think that that was fully original, let me introduce you to the 15 Stephen King books mashed together to make that series. Anyway, I don't want to get into that here. I mean, we can all have a fight in the comments. I mean, everybody loves that series, loves it to their core, and most of the people who do are Christian or Catholic. Not being, like, religionist. I mean, go ahead, prove me wrong in the comments. If this was your favorite show from Mike Flanagan and you don't have some kind of Jesus-based trauma in your past, uh, you're a damn liar. Confess. Number eight, The Creator. 
Everybody always complains about the lack of originality in Hollywood. But when we finally get an original burst of sci-fi genius that subverts both the Hollywood blockbuster machine as well as the trappings of modern VFX, everybody just kind of ignores it and treats it like crap. Cut the cameras. Dead end. I did an entire video on the masterpiece that is the creator, so I'm not going to spin my wheels here too much when that video pretty much says it all. But essentially, Gareth Edwards is on an incredible young Spielberg-esque hot streak that isn't getting the recognition that it should be. And the creator is the zenith of all of his visual and storytelling prowesses leading up to this moment. Someday, we're all going to look back on the career of Gareth Edwards in astonishment. But until then, I'll just have to keep simping for one of the best movies of the year which people have been treating like that one ant with dandruff who always brings you socks for Christmas. Now get out there and try to support a genuinely amazing film that isn't based on a damn Mattel doll or a tabletop board game. Gareth Edwards is dying for your sins, y'all. Help him. Number 7. Bottoms A24 and Rachel Snote simply do not miss. And this is another clear-cut example of why both Snote and A24 are here for the long haul. Hey, uh... Girl, thanks for coming in today. We have to come in. It's class. Try telling Dimitri Walker that. The little motherfucker came the first week and I ain't seen him since. Dimitri Walker committed suicide the first week of school, Mr. G. <laughs> sure he did. Movies like Bottom simply don't get made enough, and only under the blessed mercy of Production House A24 can we see a movie about a bunch of nerds who kill a bunch of jocks, and no one has to sit around crying about it. A24 projects with Rachel Sinote, much like Euphoria, put me in a place where both sides of my creative id are being stoked. One side is my pure Jewish heterosexuality that just glares right through the artistic presentation of this film and controls my entire brain because I am in love with Rachel Snow. The other side of my id is the weird theater camp nerd who likes things like bottoms because I am in touch with my feminine side and actually enjoy an earned female comedy when it's done right. There's something so kitsch and perfect about everything that I've seen Rachel Snowden, so while I'm busy deciding whether I want her autograph or whether I want to show up to her Hollywood pad in an unmarked Sprinter van, I can still enjoy all of her work with both sides of my brain. Uh, God, I really hate where this has ended up, but I made a capsule review for this movie on this channel that is a lot more succinct. But to be brief, Bottoms is a hilarious, heartfelt, genius little slice of A24 goodness that is without a doubt my favorite all-around comedy of the year. Uh, go see it and like to my FBI agent, just forget, forget everything I said here. Okay, off to my court-appointed therapy. Bye. Number six. Holy jokers dangling dingle, Batman. This movie's wild. Saltburn starts out as this kind of classy mid-road between Rules of Attraction and The Holdovers, giving off this classy and refined prep school vibe that felt mature, earned, and well-researched. Then, about halfway through this thing, the wheels absolutely fall off, and Saltburn becomes this pulpy reimagining of the assassination of Gianni Versace by way of euphoria. This is one of the most unexpected, brazen, and frankly disgusting movies I've seen all year. Taking the glint off the capitalist fever dreams like Triangle of Sadness and injecting it into a raw, overly sexualized mega perversion that had me equal parts gagging and biting my bottom lip. The fact needs to be said that Barry Keegan is the future of cinema, and this movie is the crystal ball into that future that has given the world a glimpse, or an eyeful, of this sexy, dangerous, f***ing insane person who's probably going to control the cinema landscape for generations to come. What a wacky, committed, and brilliant film that isn't afraid to go there, everywhere, all at once. I mean, I thought that a woman being baked into a full Thanksgiving turkey would be the most depraved thing that I saw this year, but then this little slice of pure, putrid, Pasolini-esque mayhem dropped in from the heavens and made me physically sick. This movie started as a pretty genuine drama, but ended up like a mukbang after a viewing of Salo. Anyway, this is a great movie, one of the best of the year, and commands a cult following immediately. Number five, The Holdovers. Y'all, Wes Anderson finally made a masterpiece again. What, what's a rickshaw? You're an asshole, Coons. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, what's that? This is an Alexander Payne movie? Are you serious? 
Just like that, my man Payne comes in from the top rope with a movie that feels so kitsch, so 70s, so acoustic folk guitar-y that Nick Drake would have popped this one on during a schizophrenic meltdown. For all his framing BS and soundtrack pornography and overloaded images of antiques, Wes Anderson could never make a movie that feels so quintessentially quaint and period accurate that you'll be checking the credits to verify that this actually wasn't from 1971. Paul Giamatti goes full Bo's Afraid here, playing his <sighs> ugliest, most pathetic, most cross-eyed version of himself, taking self-deprecation to new fish-scented lows that goes to show that there truly is no character repulsive enough for a man of his bravado. This is a classic drama, a beautiful coming-of-age yarn, and a sublimely sweet look into a simpler time that had problems and hurdles unique to the period, illustrated beautifully without much cheese or contrivance. Just a once-in-a-generation artifact here, uh, the kind of movie that, I don't know, somebody would probably say is boring. but still somehow majorly appealed to whatever intellect I still have squirreled away after seeing 37 Marvel movies since 2008. Anyway, this is a great movie. Watch it. I don't know. It's your choice. Number four, Godzilla minus one. I want to review this movie, I really do, but I just did a full Godzilla MonsterVerse video on this channel and I already talked a little bit about this there. So instead of explaining how emotionally gripping, utterly terrifying, and positively classy Godzilla Minus One is, I just want to talk about one moment from the film that I just can't get over. People told me to like get ready for Godzilla's best atomic breath yet, but for real, in the IMAX movie theater that day, it legitimately felt like the THX scene from the Tiny Toon Adventures movie. I had tears streaming out of my eyes, winced in absolute horror and glee, like the faces of the famous ladies I see on the internet. But the only thing in my mouth was the remnants of a stale pretzel bite. I looked around me at a theater of all fat men with unsuccessful beard patterns, all of them literally in this moment of terrific ecstasy as we felt a range of every emotion on this planet swirl through our fat brains as we watched Godzilla thirst burp an entire city into absolute ruin like a wayward sneeze from the depths of an ancient god. I will never get over this moment, this effect shot, uh, the explosion of unreal terror and destruction as Godzilla laid waste to a city of people that we actually cared about for once. Wow, what an original idea to have a movie in which an entire city is destroyed be actually emotionally resonant. I don't know who the genius was that decided that a monster movie had to be for window-licking, action-figure-pegging idiots, but that day in the local IMAX theater, I watched Big G not only level the city of Ginza, but I also witnessed Gojira blow away all the hurt and trauma that the lopsided, idiotic, inanely brainless American monsterverse has polluted our airways with for a decade now. This is how it's done. Bow to the king. Not this one, uh, this one. Number three, Bo is afraid. Are you scared of your own wiener? I mean, you shouldn't be. I mean, it's really that that is a sad that's a sad situation to be in for sure. Do you have a mother who cock blocks you to death? <laughs> Did you ever think about starting a prompt on chat GPT AI and the only parameter is make it more pathetic and you just keep entering it over and over and over again and rejecting the results for 15 days straight? Until the bot says, Sir, I can't make him any more pathetic. And then BAM! You have your protagonist for three hours? Did you ever think, Oh, I love Ari Aster. I wish he would drop all the pretense and make something completely unlovable. Not scary, not paced well, and with a giant penis in the third act. Then boy, oh boy, do I have a swollen ball bag of a movie for you. Your testicles are significantly distended. Mm. Bo's Afraid is the definition of no f**ks given, a take-no-prisoner journey through the depths of Jewish self-hatred, as epic as the Iliad and as self-deprecating, blunt, and pessimistic as the first three words that come to my brain when I see myself in the mirror. This is me! This movie is like if Darren Aronofsky, Kafka, Kaufman, Woody Allen, and Ari Aster all met up together at a Jewish sleepaway camp and smushed their wieners together while nobody was watching. 
Ari Aster is a Jewish king, a lord of neuroses, and an apparently complete lunatic. I'm not sure where his career is headed after this movie. I guess our beloved horror auteur took a hard left here, folks. This would be like if Jordan Peele's next movie was called, like, let's stay in theme here, Penis. I'm not sure I want to see this movie for a third time, but the second time I watched it, it was a masterpiece, and I'd like to leave it at that. I actually hate these self-indulgent over-explorations on the filmmaking id, but Jesus, this one went so far and never stopped never stopping, and I'll always be eternally grateful for that. Thanks for shooting yourself in the foot for us, Ari. You could have made another crowd-slaying horror film, but now I'm not sure you'll be let within 250 feet of a school. Absolute king. Number two. When Evil Lurks. When Evil Lurks is the kind of pus-filled, horror-laced nightmare that calls back everything from the best of Sam Raimi to the most garish of French New Wave horror from the early 2000s. This movie is about as brutal as a Nashville hot halal sandwich on a 105 degree day in Tucson, Arizona. Take that David Gordon Green Exorcist movie and wipe your whole entire butt with it because When Evil Lurks is that long daddy dick horror that makes American horror look like American everything. In that it is bad. This is terrible. America shouldn't be allowed to remake anything ever again. When Evil Lurks is that Argentinian dank that's going to put your entire life in utter chaos for hours after watching it. Because you don't know whether you should throw up, shower, or throw up in the shower. Yo, you're sick to my stomach, fam. This is a THE horror movie of the year. And while the YouTube boys behind Talk To Me would probably downvote this video for saying this, this movie is the ballsiest and most macabre horror experience of the year. Watch this one, I mean, it's on Shudder. Just do like a free trial or something. What am I, your accountant? Number one. Let's end this list with my favorite show from HBO Max about the dangers of inhabiting a far distant, hostile world full of mystery and horror. Raised by wolves. <laughs> God, this hurt to even do as a gag. Scavenger's Reign is the new hot sci-fi slut of the year, combining gargantuan cosmic horror with legitimately fascinating hard sci-fi elements. The planet in question that our puny humans must survive is an absolute menagerie of flora and fauna that seems spawned from the absolute pits of hell. This show is a terrifying, thrilling, genius, gorgeous, and positively haunting masterpiece that scores an easy 10 out of 10 for me and makes it as easy to recommend as a Doritos Locos family box after the cat has dissipated in your cerebral cortex four hours after leaving the club. This is the best sci-fi show of the year, and you're gonna wanna mainline this one immediately if things like Raised by Wolves, Prometheus, 2001 A Space Odyssey, or Europa Report wet your whistle. This will hold us big brains over until Three Body Problem comes out on Netflix next year, which, read, read that book series. Stop, stop watching YouTube read a real book. And even if Scavenger's Reign doesn't get renewed for its easily earned second season, it'll stand the test of time as a singular chunk of sci-fi glory that ranks with the absolute best of the genre, while presenting a visually marvelous and spectacularly terrifying world all of its own. Everything I love about media in general at this point in our history is included in this series. From cosmic horror to arresting visuals, to the thing that keeps this channel and my car running nightmare fuel. Anyway, people, uh, thanks for sticking with me on this list. Of course, there is so much that went unmentioned here. Uh, there's so much in the course of this video uh, that came up in my mind as I was making this. Probably could have been a list of like a million more, but I wanted to get you guys something to kick off the new year with. Um, if you liked this content, please like and subscribe to the channel. Please check out the other videos on this channel that I made when I had like three subscribers that I think warrant your attention. Uh, other than that, I am DS Lions rounding out my first half year on this platform with a very hearty, this is your boy DS from the movie Blues. Smell you later. The end. I can't end these things. It's like SNL skits. They don't know how to... I don't know how to end videos. What do you, what do you want to see um, in the new year from this channel? What, what, what can I do for myself to you? What can I do? What can I thrust myself upon for your bemusement? Let me know in the commies below. Goodbye.